We've got a great panel today, and we're going to be talking about, about changing identity and how external factors can change your identity throughout your life and applying that to Milwaukee. So I think the first order of business really should be just to have you all introduce yourselves. Uh, nobody can introduce you quite as well as you can. And we're going to be sharing some really personal stories today as well uh, because uh, each, each member of our panel has gone through a transformation of their own. So uh, let's start with, with you. You can just introduce yourself. My name is Sarah DeGeorge. Um, I work at UW-Milwaukee and the LGBT Resource Center there. Um, I'm a transgender woman, so I try to sort of support the younger students there into their own identities in college. Hello good afternoon. My name is Jose Vasquez. Um, I currently work with a program called Life Changers the United Community Center. I also do street youth outreach with God Touch Milwaukee. Um, but the main focus of reaching inner city at risk, high risk youth, or any youth that have uh, the vulnerability of falling under influences. Hi, my name is Rabbi T. Barrett Barenbaum, and I facilitate the spiritual leader of Congregation Shir Hadad. <coughs> Um, I have been here for four years. Uh, my spiritual journey is um, I chose Judaism and I chose, in a way, um, to own my blackness in a, in a different fashion. Hi, I'm Pastor Marilyn Miller. I am the pastor of Reformation Lutheran Church. It's an ELCA Lutheran Church, very small congregation, worshiping on 39th and Lisbon at the United Methodist Children's Services Community Room, and renting on 38th and Lisbon. And I serve as the president of an organization called MICA, Milwaukee Inner City Congregations Allied Firm. Well, big thanks to our panel, and thank you all for being here today. Obviously, one theme in the play that we that we really see portrayed on all aspects is identity and changing identities. In fact, each person in the play, each character, experiences their own journey based on external factors in the world around them. So, I, I guess, what connections did you make with the with the play uh, and with the characters, seeing that, that transformation take place of their identities personally? So, what what personal connection did did, did you share with the characters? Well, especially with, with Amir, it's sort of looked like he um, performed a variety of identities throughout his life. Um, and it's, that's obviously something I've done. Um, I've always had sort of an internal identity, um, but until I was like ready to display that, it was a series of sort of like portraying sort of somewhat false identities, but they were still a part of me. And all those, um, whether it was um, trying to be like a masculine athlete in high school, or I was in the military and trying to trying to be the active duty person, um, those are still a part of me, and they were in a way authentic, but um, a lot of my life was sort of performing identities, and the end result is sort of like a mesh of everything that's come together since. Did you feel a, like a sense of conflict with these, with these different identities? This this person that you had within you that maybe wasn't quite as representing to the world. Oh, absolutely! It definitely many times felt like I was selling myself out. Um, and now, like now that I'm past that, um, like there are definitely times during those moments where um, I had moments of happiness and. Realizing it wasn't a complete lie, um, trying to like mesh that together and piece your piece together what actually is inside you is uh, a little bit of sort of like a mind game, trying to figure that all out. Interesting. Well, zooming back out to uh, to kind of the external factors that that we deal with in society and with our with our line of work, I would like to ask you about just kind of your journey in this role in your work at the UCC and uh, you know really connecting with young men and women who, who uh, you know, need, the, need that connection point, that positive interaction with an adult. What kind of societal external factors are you seeing kind of affecting the, the people that you serve? Um, I think that a lot of the factors are some in-house dysfunctional things from upbringing, from a cultural standpoint, from 
as far as a young man, how he's raised, the, the climate, as far as whether there's a, both parents in the house or not in the house, um, whether there is education in the house or there's not education in the house. I think for myself, how I could relate was what a mere, um, he didn't want to accept things about himself that were existing. He wanted to kind of um, keep them from being exposed. And I think that one of the things that I, how I could relate to that was that when you work with um, a different variety of youth, there comes a point where you, you get exposed as far as the choices that you made in life, the consequences that led to those, those choices and the consequences that came from those choices. And sometimes, um, for myself, there can be a moment of embarrassment because I made that choice or because I believe a certain way and I don't know how to believe like that. So there is, for myself, there's the moment of how do I accept it and allow young men and women that I work with to accept what their conditions are, what their reality is, versus the reality and what they want to become. Interesting and very well said. Uh, moving along, I, you know, I wanted to ask you, you said that your journey began, what, four years ago? My journey here in Milwaukee began four okay. years ago. So tell me about, about the transformation that's, that's taken place in your life. You know, it's very interesting, you know, what you just said about education being in the home. Because um, I, 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 well, that's really what was paramount in my home, in my upbringing, is to be educated. Um, we, we weren't religious and we weren't culturally African-American, my parents pushed education. So now the, the piece of my identity that I value the most is being highly educated. Um, and I had to taste, you know, you were saying that you had all of these identities inside of you. I got to sort of experiment with different identities. I went through a Latino phase, I went through an Indian, the Hindu phase, and I learned all these languages because I didn't have any of this. My own. So Did, I, was it was it like based on something that you knew that you like like it was within you that you wanted to explore? Or like what prompted that? It was a nagging. You know, we need a grounding in identity. And identity it's who we are. When we look in the mirror, it's the story that we tell ourselves of us. And I didn't have that, so I was searching for that. Um, and when I discovered Judaism and that language, I said, Oh, this is the language of my soul. And when I came here to Milwaukee, um, because I'm from Boston which is a very multicultural metropolitan city. And I came here to Milwaukee and I felt so black because of the stark differences um, with class and race. And I really felt like I needed to come back and own the blackness that I was born with in order to um, help and, and make a difference here in Milwaukee. So just building on that, so uh, when you were, you know, back before you came to Milwaukee, uh, is it something that you just didn't just didn't th think about so much as part of your identity, or it wasn't as pronounced, you know, based on the external factors of the city, or what? What made you feel that way? Yeah, both. I mean, I, I we didn't grow up talk. I didn't grow up in my household talking about slavery or civil rights or any of that. I didn't have any of that baggage put on me, and I, I so I guess I didn't notice the external factors, but I noticed it much more here in Milwaukee. I notice when people are following me around the stores. I notice when people are, are expecting that I'm going to be a different way and are shocked when I'm you know, able to, like a, in the play, when I'm able to um, interact with them on their level. So. Interesting. Well, I, I'm curious to know a bit more about Micah and about what Micah does because uh, you know, certainly many journeys taking place within our congregations on an individual level and on a city level. So just tell us a little bit about Micah. Uh, Milwaukee Inner City Congregations Ally for Hope is uh, about 40 plus interreligious organizations that are trying to figure out ways to work for justice in the city of Milwaukee. And uh, it's interesting because right now we're going through this what we call cutting issues phase. Some of you are involved with like Common Ground and other organizations that do organizing work. And so what we're doing is trying to help people, first of all, recognize their own power that they have to change the world. Because so many of us feel powerless when we interact with the world. So a part of our job, we feel, is to grow a grassroots group of people, as many as we can, that sense their own power from whatever sources that that comes from so that they can be powerful in the world. Does, 
We need power to change things. Well, let me ask you about that, that feeling of powerlessness, because I think there are certain elements that we saw in each of our characters, too, that, that kind of feeling. So what sort of external factors in Milwaukee do you think are shaping that powerless feeling that, that so many are feeling? Well, I grew up in Milwaukee, so unlike my sister here, my experience began here, and I've been here my whole life. And so just the um, being born to a two-parent family, both African descent people, this brown skin as a woman in the world has affected everything about what has happened to me. So I cannot separate those things in any way. They're all a part of who I am. Um, <clears throat> growing up on the north side of Milwaukee and experiencing a segregated community and all the pieces and parts that come with that, I, I have a pretty clear understanding of what happens to people in terms of things like internalized racial oppression. So when we start talking about the- That seems like internalized racial oppression. <laughs> yeah, the, okay. the racism and what it causes and affects, people of color often start to internalize this pain, this hurt, this hopelessness, this powerlessness, and then it manifests itself in many different ways. And so for me, that has been a huge part of my own personal struggle <clears throat> to learn how to address that. And I personally believe that, unfortunately, a whole lot of people of color never get the opportunity to address that in their lives. And so what you see is the manifestation of that hurt, that pain, that hopelessness, that powerlessness. And what do people do? Then they act out of that in broken ways. And so we even saw it in the play where it manifests itself in things that we never wanted to do, but you end up doing. Right, and, and, and we saw some characters, uh, you know, Amir especially, taking on behaviors that, that he swore would never be something that he would do, you know, and, and we saw this change in him. So just kind of looking at Milwaukee, you know, in a lot of ways, the, the work that we saw today is kind of an extreme case, you know, and in a lot of ways, Milwaukee is kind of an extreme case for, you know, the attitudes towards my, uh, multiculturalism in the United States. Um, so just kind of, you know, taking some of the themes from the play, and broadening out, you know, looking at Milwaukee as a small-scale example to our nation, you know, what sort of external factors should we be mindful of, uh, you know, in, in society, in American society, and how do those shape the individual? Because each of you, uh, you come from such different backgrounds. <laughs> with that, I'd like to maybe start with you and my mind here. Just, just talk a little bit about, you know, kind of Milwaukee as a springboard for the rest of the nation, and maybe some of the, you know, external factors that we should be aware of moving forward. Yeah, um, I think, I think one big thing is to um, be, be willing to have conversations and not make assumptions. Um, it's something that, um, even with my experience where I've sort of been in some roles that didn't sort of like mesh with my personal value system, um, I'm still guilty of sort of like putting up barriers to, my, to interacting with people, just making assumptions. Um, trying to to stick in my own bubble, um, which um, I think that's that's as much as I'll say about Milwaukee because I, I really don't have um, don't have the experience to sort of make any claims about the city or uh, how to expand on that. Um, I personally think that. There are a lot of different issues that anybody and everybody could point out that make differences between people and the differences. I think that if we adopted the model of not being offended when we challenge or when we look for progress in an issue, then we can get to the bottom of it. I mean, that's from the scale of um, community people working with community from agencies to law enforcement to, to uh, religious organizations. You know, you can put any kind of program, any kind of agenda out there, but the bottom line is that you gotta, like she said, you have to have a dialogue. And this dialogue has to start with, I believe the model, don't be offended. You know, because you may hear something, you may not know something, but if you put your personal beliefs, your personal experiences to the side and you just listen and you try to understand from a standpoint of listening, then I think it opens the gateways for a lot more things to get out and more constructive uh, criticism and also you can be able to plan a little better 
because um, your mind's not so clouded. Um, I, I think about, um, for instance, a lot of the choices in, that I see that shape a lot of people's identity come from external circumstances, you know, low level education, poverty, um, fatherlessness, uh, drugs and alcohol, um, even the inability to teach your kids how to communicate about how they feel, why it's important to express how they feel in a positive manner without allowing it to outburst. You know? Then you have to deal with the mental health issues, then you have to deal with other issues which um, probably make, a, make it a little more climax because you may not understand it, you may not believe it, or you don't want to. Yeah. I think you make a really uh, interesting point about just you know, listening and, and maybe putting, putting aside your, your fears or your assumptions that maybe somebody's trying to be offensive or you know, just understanding that a lot of this community building that we're trying to do in Milwaukee, it starts with just that listening step. So with the last uh, five minutes here, um, I'd like to continue on and, and just kind of focus on uh, you know, that personal journey in Milwaukee that we've all been on, you know, uh, applying that to the big picture and like how do you, I guess, how do you prevent yourself from, you know, what happened with the mirror like we saw where, where you become, you know, in, in, in such an effort to, to adapt your identity based on external factors, you know, that you become this kind of realization of so many things that you detest. So where is that line and how do you, and kind of like, how do you know um, as your, you know, as your, as your identity changes through your life? If I could, I think like from noticing Amir, one of the outlets he didn't have is um, he didn't have anybody he could he could talk to um, where he could expose his true inner feelings and fears, you know. And part of your identity, um, you can lose your dignity in what you go through, you know. Some people, um, I know for myself, um, you can make some choices, and the choices may not be. Uh, positive and it can have negative outcomes and those negative outcomes can impact how you view yourself, how you value yourself. And I think that if you have a strong sense of uh, maybe accountability or some kind of outlet where you can talk about these things because if not then you kind of become a um, passive aggressive and you rather than rather than um, see how they would impact you, you can make a negative. For instance, I give you an example. If I'm holding something within myself that I don't have an outlet to talk about, and I know that me acting on what I'm feeling could cause me to go back to the identity that I don't want to have anymore, you know, and me remaking my identity and becoming, you know, active for the youth, active out there on the front lines, trying to find um, programs, trying to find funding to help educate the youth, to help them not become statistics. Right. You know, I could easily get caught up in that and allow myself to fail them by not having that outlet in my own life. Yeah, well said. All right, with our last few minutes here, I do want to ask about, you know, just identity itself. Can identity change? And do you see it happening in, in, in your life and, and with the people that, that you work with, I guess, in your organization professionally and, and um, in your line of work, I guess? Well, you know, what kind of identity changes do you see personally happening? Because it's not always a bad thing. Yeah, I, you know, there, there, I believe that there is something of an individual that remains static throughout their lifetime. That, that spark of who they are, someone called that the soul. Um, the soul of a person really stays the same. And that we do go on these journeys of self-discovery. Um, and I think about my own journey of self-discovery. I mean, I had a totally different name. I've gone through a number of different names. <laughs> um, <laughs> I felt like I'm here. I'm like, oh, I've never changed my social security number, but. <laughs> you know, there's just, how do we want to be called in the world? What kinds of things are we manifesting and, and bringing to ourselves? Um, and, you know, thinking, just to, to harken back to this idea that you brought up about powerlessness. Um, it's so easy for us to feel powerless, not just people of color or people um, who are dealing with identity issues, but thinking about the world that we're living in right now and things are coming at us from left and right. Where, where do we even stand on certain issues and how do we decide which issue to choose? So we do nothing <laughs> because we feel overwhelmed because it's so much. And I feel like that is a, that is a divide and conquer technique that if we can all just lay down, then we can be run over. But you know, finding the thing that really speaks to our soul and say, no, that's uniquely me. I truly believe in, 
education, or I truly believe in reversing the ban, or I truly believe in you know, whatever issues we really believe in that really speak to our soul from old, and holding on to that and going with that, um, that I don't think changes. Wow. <laughs> um, I guess I would say a couple of things that I would hope to see in Milwaukee. Um, having been here my whole life, I think there's a few things that we can all be a part of to make a difference. The first thing is, as Amir, um, I think at the end, began to realize, you have to discover who you are. And that means you have to do some deep, hard soul searching and looking at your biases, your prejudices, your hurts, and all the stuff that goes with these cross-cultural, ethnic, class relationships. After you do that, you really need to get educated about the rest of the people in the world. And unfortunately, we don't do a good job of that. We hardly know anything about anybody else's history other than our own. So that's a huge error, I think. You know, as we, sit, yeah, as we sit here in Black History Month, I would love to hear from each one of you what you know about African descent history in this country. And if you didn't get a good education about that, it's time to get one. You know, we can sit here and talk about what didn't happen 50 years ago, but you can do something about it right now. So we all need to do that. Um, people of color got robbed because we didn't get to learn our history in school. No. So we all have to look at this and then two things I would say as we close is internalized racial oppression and white fragility, white privilege have to be addressed in each one of our lives. As people of color, there's some stuff that has happened to us. Ugly, terrible things. Sometimes we don't even recognize that they've happened until we react. White people have to address what's happened to them. And unfortunately, many of them don't have a clue that something has happened to them, that they have been stolen from as well. To not know the people around you, to not understand their history, to not know their context, you've been robbed. You have been robbed. Well, thank you very much, and a big thanks to our panel.